Hi everyone! I have a couple of announcements to make before I get into this week's lecture, which is the second part of spatial analysis. So first of all, starting from the week 12 module, so that means this includes lab 8 and discussion 2, um, all assignments will have a laxed late policy. Um, this is due to the shelter in place order. Um, though I do encourage you all to try and keep up with the week schedules so you don't end up with a pile of work at the end of the semester, I'll no longer be applying the previous course slate policy. I understand that we are all experiencing a shift in workload and availability due to the pandemic, and I want to make sure you're focusing on completing the work and not stressing about deadlines. All due dates will stay the same but the assignments will remain open until the end of the semester to turn in. If the assignment is over a week late, there will be a one-time penalty of 10%. This applies only to the lab activities and discussions. If I don't receive late assignments by May 12th, you'll get a zero on those assignments. Um, all quizzes will be open from Thursday to Tuesday and will not be extended without prior notice and approval from myself. The final exam will only be available on the scheduled final day of May 12th, and you'll have two hours to complete it and two attempts to try for a higher score. So I hope that helps ease everybody's stress. Um, and so if you have any questions about that, please contact me by email, or we could set up a Zoom meeting during um, the scheduled class times. Okay, so to wrap up from week 12 module, you guys should have read Bolstad chapter 9, pages 373 through 402. Um, you'll need to participate and complete in discussion 2, which is due tonight by 11.59 by p.m., but again, just refer to the new late policy. Um, so if you are behind on that, that's okay. Same with completing Lab 8, which is also due this evening by 11.59 p.m. Um, so for this week's module, week 13, um, we'll be completing the uh, Bolstad Chapter 9 reading. So that'll be pages 403 through 428. You'll need to participate in and complete Discussion 2, um, which is going to be due... Uh, next Tuesday, the 21st by 11.59 p.m. Again, the sooner that you could get your discussion submissions in, the sooner other students are going to have the opportunity to reply to you and you'll be able to get your reply to their submissions as well. <clears throat> um, so there is going to be a lab for this week, Lab 9, which is also due next Tuesday on the 21st. Um, you'll notice that this lab is not as long as the other labs, though, um, please give yourself enough time to get through it. It should be pretty straightforward and you'll be using some new spatial operations, but other than that, it'll be mostly review and so and good practice to be able to move forward to next week, which um, mostly we've been focusing on vector analysis. And so next week we'll be focusing on raster analysis. You'll also notice that this week there will be a reading quiz. So that quiz is going to open up on Thursday at 6.05 and then you'll have until the 21st at 11.59 p.m. to complete the quiz. Um, <clears throat> you'll have two attempts to take it and the lower sc score will be dropped. And of course, it's going to be open book and open note. Um, you'll have 20 minutes to take the quiz. And again, um, the new late policy does not apply to the quizzes for whatever reason. If you aren't able to um, complete the quiz within that time frame, please contact me beforehand and let me know what's going on so we can discuss our options moving forward. Okay. So in review from last week, we know that in the most basic form, executing spatial operations usually involves a map layer input and a map layer output. A map layer is the visual representation of geospatial data and GIS software. Solving a problem often requires a chain of spatial operations executed in a sequence. 
So this is another example of graphical representation of spatial analysis. Operations are individual components of a spatial analysis. As recalls all of their tools in ARC toolbox, geoprocessing tools. So you guys should have been exposed to this already. Um, you can access your ARC toolbox by opening up the ARC toolbox window. Um, and then a lot of these basic um, spatial operation functions that we're going to be going over today, you can also bring down um, from the geoprocessing tab at the top of the screen in ArcMap. So just to go over what we have in this slide really quickly, I want you to become more familiar with these flowcharts. Um, just a heads up, next week we'll be building on the this week's discussion question. I'm asking you to come up with a research question. And so next week I'm going to be having you create a super simple diagram just like this um, with a flow chart just describing what you would think you would need to do to help answer that question that you come up with. So again, you're going to have your input layer um, and it'll flow to that first op spatial operation, which is going to give you your first new layer, second spatial operation, and so on until you come up with your uh, potential output. Um, and again, the output from a spatial operation may be spatial. Um, for example, a new data layer is produced or the output may be non-spatial where you have a single value or a table as an output. So last week we went over uh, selection and or also known as query operations. So this is a part of that spatial analysis process. Um, so I'm talking about the select by attribute or by location, which we went over when we were uh, covering database management systems and attribute tables. Uh, last week, we also went over buffering, which is a proximity tool, and dissolving, which is a generalization tool. And again, buffering is a different type of overlay operation. Um, it's just separated because it has that additional function of proximity. This week, we're going to go over some of the more basic overlay operations, uh, the clip, intersect, union, and erase functions. And we're also going to review classification or grouping similar features together for display or analysis. Next week, we'll get more into conversion between data models, um, such as converting a vector model to a raster model and vice versa. Um, and again, many operations incorporate both the attribute and coordinate data. So for a quick review, a dissolve function is primarily used to combine similar features within a data layer. Adjacent polygons may have identical values for an attribute. It dissolves the boundaries between the features that share the same attribute. This is a generalization tool. Um, some reasons why you would want to dissolve is it's helpful in removing unneeded information. It reduces storage space and increased processing speed and prior to applying an area based selection. <clears throat> so you can kind of see here you have um, multiple polygons with different values and instead of dissecting each of those polygons into smaller units. You're going to combine all of those units into a smooth output polygon, as you can see here. Buffering is an operation that creates a buffer and is useful for proximity analysis. A buffer is a zone around a map feature with an area calculated using distance or time. Buffering may apply may be applied to point features, line features, or polygon features. However, the output will always be a polygon feature. So we have three main types of buffers. We've got the fixed distance buffer, multi-ring buffer, and variable distance buffer. Um, <clears throat> so with the fixed distance buffers, every feature that you are buffering gets buffered by the same distance. 
Um, when we're doing the multi-ring or nested buffer, you're buffering at multiple distances. This is really useful when different actions are required at different difference distances. And then we have our variable distance buffer. Um, the buffer distance, as its name describes, is variable and may change among features. Um, and the buffer distance may increase in steps. For example, we may have one buffer distance for a given set of features and a different buffer distance for the remaining features. Bolstad states that overlay operations are powerful tools and were an important driving force behind the development of GIS technologies. An overlay operation is a spatial operation in which two or more data sets are superimposed on one another to assess the relationship between features that occupy the same geographic space. Overlay operations also share common elements with other spatial query operations. The primary difference is that overlay operations use a spatial query to create new data sets. So when you perform a spatial query, like select by attribute or location, the output feature data set keeps the same feature geometry, length, area, distance, and they also keep the same um, attribute table. You're not going to see any difference in that um, when you're looking at all of your features. When you perform an overlay operation, your attribute geometry changes, therefore your attribute table changes as well. For example, if you were to clip a rose layer to be within a study area, the output data set would only include the sections of roads within that set boundary resulting in shorter road lengths and we'll get laid we'll get into this later in the lecture um and again we've mostly just been looking at vector overlay last week we looked a little bit at um raster buffer zones but um we're definitely focusing on that vector overlay so <clears throat> what you're doing with a spatial with an overlay operation is you're going to have your input layer and then you're going to have your feature layer or whatever function you want that input layer to be um, changed to and it's going to give you that output of the two overlaid layers which would you know we'll go over the different types of combinations in the next slide. <clears throat> 